Okay, uh, that's great. So, um, Ingmar, uh, welcome. So, uh, welcome to um, Ingmar Weber, who is the uh, research director for social computing for the Qatar Computing Research Institute. And uh, as is very clear from the screen, we'll be talking today about remote social sensing for mapping poverty, migration, and digital gender gaps. Ingmar, take it away. Great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard, for the opportunity to, to present my work uh, to this uh, group. Um, right, so before I get into the actual sort of content, just a quick acknowledgement of um, the number of col uh, collaborators who have contributed to this lineup over the years. So here at QTI, this is in particular my colleagues uh, Joao and Masumani, and then at the University of Oxford, there is Riti Kashia. But there are many, many more people, uh, both at UN agencies, uh, other universities, and more who have co uh, contributed to this um, uh, work. So um, what is it that I'll be talking about? So I'll talk about a particular type of um, remote sensing. So I'll talk about remote social sensing, but let's just start with sort of general remote uh, sensing. Right? So here I'm just lazily copying, copying the definition from Wikipedia, right? So remote sensing is the acquisition of information about an object or phenomenon without making physical contact with an object, and thus is in contrast to on-site observation. Right? And so you've all sort of seen this sort of work before, typically it's done sort of through satellites or aircraft, right? So here often in the sort of when it comes to sort of modeling, um, monitoring sort of climate, right here there's um, you know, satellite imagery that sort of shows uh, sort of uh, glaciers are melting. Um, you know, here there's similarly a, a satellite imagery that sort of shows sort of deforestation um, uh, uh, in the Amazon, and then sort of closer to sort of, you know, um, economic development sort of, sort of, so of course, you know, uh, night lights have been used for quite a long time, for example, to show uh, the lack of, you know, economic development in North Korea compared to South Korea, just looking at how much night is being admitted at night. So this is all sort of traditional um, sort of remote sensing. Now, what is remote sort of social sensing? Well, it's pretty much the same thing, but uh, looking at um, the things that you are sensing, right, are not trees, are not glaciers, are not sort of lights, but are sort of people, right, sort of, right? So, um, so it's, you know, you're, you're trying to, to sort of sense a society or social phenomenon um, uh, uh, more broadly, right? And so uh, how could this be done? So again, you could also use satellite imagery, right? Sort of economic activity is sort of man-made clearly, right? But you could also try things such as sort of Google Trends, uh, Twitter, uh, but in this talk, I'll talk about how you can sort of remotely sense, um, how you can do remote social sensing using advertising uh, data. So um, probably many of you have heard the slogan, if you are not paying for the product, and you are the product, right? So if you're, you're, not, you're not paying for Facebook, you're not paying for Google, right? You're not paying for most of these services. So, you know, how are they making money? Of course, they're making money through targeted uh, advertising. So how does this work? So they collect a lot of information um, about their users. And then, you know, using this information, they collect, sort of they, they build certain profiles about you with certain attributes, right? And then advertisers can use these attributes to target their ads. So as a concrete example, on Facebook, I can show an ad only to female Facebook users living in London, age 25 to 29, who lived in Poland and who use an iOS device, right? So quite specific sort of so in terms of who am I targeting. And then the crucial thing uh, about this is that um, before I launch my advertising campaign, and so before I have to pay anything, Facebook tells me how many people match these targeting criteria. Okay, so this is gives me, uh, yeah, so this is what's called sort of audience estimates. Right? So in this particular example, so it's a real example, sort of, so Facebook tells me that there are 2,600 monthly active users matching these um, uh, criteria, right? So think of this as a sort of real time census over about uh, 3 billion Facebook users, right? Where you can sort of ask how many of these 3 billion users match certain criteria. Uh, and you get an answer in uh, real time, right? So what can you do um, with this, right? So, so, so or more, more specifically, how can you use this for remote uh, social sensing? So um, first, let me just make this very concrete, what the sort of the, the, the data looks like, so to speak, or how you, uh, or sort of how, how, what the advertising platform looks like, right? So you, after this call, uh, you know, you can um, just follow the steps for creating a, a, an ad campaign on Facebook, and eventually you'll get to an interface that looks like this. So this is Facebook's ads manager, right? So here I'm targeting just part of the city of Doha, right? It's just a small neighborhood. I'm only targeting Facebook users who are men, who either lived in India or Nepal, and who are using Android devices. Why Android, we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then at this stage, sort of Facebook tells me up here that there are 40,000 people matching my uh, uh, criteria. 
Um, so this is sort of so where the data comes from. Now, um, you know, you don't have to do screen scraping. There's a very nice uh, uh, API. It's called Facebook Graph API, and we have some written some nice sort of Python wrappers, and you know, happy to, to, to sort of drop pointers to those later if that's of, um, of interest. Now, what can you do with this data? So here is the data visualization that we've created around this data. So it's not live data. So this data was collected three years ago or almost four years ago. Where um, here I'm showing data for people who used to live in Nepal. So according to this Facebook data that we've collected, their density is highest in the so-called industrial area of Doha, which was really built to house people from Southeast Asia. They're almost all men. They're very few, um, you know, these are all sort of blue collar construction workers. Um, I'll talk about the education level in a second. Um, they're fairly young, which is a blessing during sort of COVID times where, you know, most of these people have actually been infected by COVID at some point. And they're almost all Android device use, uh, users, right? Because Android devices are typically cheaper than iOS, right? So this is sort of one part of the society here in Qatar. Now, if I compare this with people um, who, who, not who lived in Nepal, but who lived in sort of Western Europe or North America, they are in a completely different part of town. Right now, I'm here, right? So not coincidentally, this is quite typical of people like me. Um, I'm here with my wife, right? So, so I, there's a certain minimum income you have to make to bring over your, your, your family to get a family visa, right? So I'm here with my, uh, with my wife. Um, you know, I have a university degree. Uh, I'm not yet in this age range, but I'm sort of, I'm getting there, right? So you have more older sort of knowledge experts and you have more iOS users than Android device users, right? So indicating there's a higher um, disposable income. Right. So um, now what's interesting in, in, in the case of Doha is that you don't have, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, census data at this resolution, certainly not. Right. Sort of, right? So, so, you know, you, you can sort of you can find out something about the society that seems to be true, at least living here sort of so in broad strokes, even though there is no, you know, no alternative data source that you could sort of tap into um, uh, for this. Uh, so, Ingmar, um, Ingmar, sorry, please. can I just ask just one please. question about please, what, please. You, what you've shown there? It, is that something you got from just looking at Ad Manager? Or, no. or you've had to go in and then pay for that data? Um, we didn't have to pay, but we had to go through sort of programmatically, right? So what does it take to collect this data, right? So for every, for every region targeted here, we would ask, okay, in this region, how many women with university degree are in this age range used to live in Western Europe and use an iOS device? Right? So this is just one query, right? And so we have all combinations for sort of, sort of, so that went into create uh, in, into creating this uh, sort of data visualization sort of right and, and but but we all of these you know hundreds of thousands if not millions of requests um you know we could do without paying a single penny or dime or whatever you like right sort of so because we never actually get to the step of launching the ad right and again you have just as much access as i do right so after this call you can you know set up a script and you can collect exactly the same kind of data for free right because you never actually launch uh, the ad campaign right thanks. so that's that's thanks for clarifying Sure, sure. No, no, and thanks for the interruption. So please, please do continue to sort of interrupt me, for, especially for the sort of clarifying uh, things, because this is really important. You know, important takeaways. This data is sort of you know available, sort of free of charge. You know, for anybody who cares to sort of look. Um, right. And so now, what is it that we want to do with this data, other than sort of you know create some sort of visualization, you know, about the city that I I, I live in? Um, so we want to uh, use this in the context of um, you know global development. Uh, to sort of improve, you know, current data. So what's wrong with sort of current data on global development? Um, so one is sort of the, you know, temporal update uh, frequency is sometimes quite slow, right? Often it's linked to sort of decennial censuses only done every 10 years. Uh, it can be quite coarse, right? So in the, in the case of sort of Uttar Pradesh, sort of, so it's one of the Indian states, I think there's like 200 million people if I'm mistaken. So, right? and you might have like one data point sort of summarizing something, right? But that's kind of, that doesn't mean much. Um, or, you know, it, it lacks this aggregation uh, across dimensions such as uh, agenda, right? So maybe, you know, you know something about the total internet penetration in a country or in a region, but you don't know um, how, you know, women um, uh, are, are affected or you know, maybe there's a sort of, um, you know, difference by, by gender. And so basically we would try to use such data to help with recency, to help sort of improve spatial granularity uh, and to help with sort of demographic disaggregation for these sort of different estimates. So um, uh, in the rest of my talk, and I, I know we started a bit late, so I'll try to you know, make up for some time. I'll basically walk through a couple of uh, case studies that we did uh, also working with partners to sort of uh, show the potential of this type of uh, data. So the first uh, case study is uh, was done in the context of uh, the Venezuelan um, uh, exodus, where we try to um, basically map um, sort of uh, the out migration, right? And so just for context, right? Sort of, sort of, sort of, you're not aware of 
what is going on or what was going on in Venezuela. So you know, in 2019, according to the International Monetary Fund, um, you know, there, there was an inf inflation of you know, t uh, 10 million percent. It's not a typo, it should be 10 million percent. Right? I mean, I'll skip the other details, but you know, needless to say, there's a huge economic crisis. And uh, as a result, at least 10 percent, probably 15 percent, if not more, of the country um, has left, uh, mostly into neighboring countries such as Colombia, Brazil, um, uh, and others, right? But especially at, this, at the time when we did the study, sort of, so, you know, good data on how many exactly and what the socioeconomic situation was sort of uh, lacking. So um, what I'm showing you here are now estimates obtained from this Facebook data. So let me try to walk you through what you see in this, um, uh, in this plot. So, so first, let's look at uh, data um, uh, in red, which is for the host country Colombia, right? So we are, we are always looking at people who lived in Venezuela in this case, right? I mean, previously I showed you something for lived in India or lived in Nepal. So here we are always looking for Facebook users who lived in Venezuela, but now in red is at that point they were then living in the destination country, Colombia, okay? So now this data point here, for example, shows that in June, 2018, you know, basically you were just sort of going to this interface conceptually, of course, we were doing programmatically, right? But you were sort of, okay, what if, if, if in June 2018, you were to launch an advertising campaign targeting people who used to live in Venezuela, who were then living in Colombia, the interface would have shown that there were about 1 million matching Facebook users, right? This is sort of this uh, data point here, right? Now, um, assuming that there are no false positives in this, this is, likely an undercount, right? Because of course not everybody is on Facebook, right? Sort of so on. So what we do with this other um, sort of a point up here is we try to correct for this by, by making assumptions. So, so we don't know the Facebook penetration among Venezuelan um, migrants in Colombia, but we assume, this is no assumption, that it's the same as in the overall Colombian population. Okay, so now suppose the overall Colombian population, about 60% are on Facebook. So we're sort of adding another missing 40% on top, right? Sort of, so just give like sort of like a, you know, most likely it's closer to this point than to this point. Of course, it's not, it's not, 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 not precise, but this is just an assumption that we sort of make, right? And this is sort of so what you then see here plotted uh, over time. Um, in, in, in gray, you have this sort of aggregated across all of Latin America. And here in, um, in, in, in black, these are sort of other sort of types of, ground truth, I put this in air quotes, sort of, sort of, because in all of this sort of migration or refugee work, sort of, you know, the official statistics is, you know, you know not, not always sort of gold standard, but it's sort of as close you can get us sort of to, to gold standard, right? And you can sort of see that the estimates from sort of Facebook are in a similar range, but probably higher than what was sort of estimated in sort of official um, uh, uh, statistics. And there's some, you know, some reason to believe that actually this might be on the low end of things. Now, if we look at sort of subnationally, again, we can do this even at the subsidy level potentially, if there's interest. But here we only did it at the sort of the sort of uh, state level essentially. Um, we we again sort of compared this data that we collected in 2018. Uh, uh, sorry, so on, on Facebook data is on the right. This is collected on Facebook 2018 with data that the Colombian government collected, as shown on the left. So this data on the left is shown uh, was collected by self registration. It basically, um, you know, Venezuelan refugees and migrants were sort of invited please come and register. But the precise benefit of that was not always clear, right? You could sort of imagine why people might um, sort of hesitate to sort of, uh, you know, to, to register. So, okay, so now if you sort of compare the sort of say official government data to sort of Facebook, you see some similarities, right? Like at least both data sources pick up quite a large number of, uh, you know, Venezuelan migrants and refugees close to the border, but then, you know, Facebook picks up a larger number compared to the government data further inland, right? And so now it's sort of okay, who's right, who's wrong, sort of so. Well, we were actually working with people in Colombia during the response, and they actually told us that this distribution looks more plausible, just based on their sort of on the ground experience, than the, the distribution in, in, in this data. And, and their hypothesis was that, or rather observation was, that the, the self-registration efforts were much more pronounced closer to the border and not so much further inland, right? So again, ultimately, we don't know, you know, the, the precise ground truth, which is the whole motivation for us to do this work in the first place. But that also means we can't know for sure, um, you know, who's right or wrong. But at least again, partners, you know, from Colombia on the ground tell us this is probably closer to the truth than uh, data from the Colombian uh, government. Um, and of course, we can also do this for other countries where there is no ground truth to, to, to begin with, right? So here we have nothing sort of to, to compare against, sort of, so on. And so here, just to mention um, Brazil, where we also picked up 
um, you know, at least some presence sort of further south. And this was all used and operationally by, by UNICEF to adjust uh, an online campaign they were running um, uh, uh, against xenophobia. But initially, they were only targeting the sort of the north, and then they also were um, sort of including this uh, region in uh, um, targeting. Um, now, going beyond just the, the sheer number of, uh, you know, migrants and, uh, and refugees, we can also get at least a glimpse um, at their socio-economic um, uh, situation, right? So, so, and, um, so let me try to also walk you through this plot here. So, um, again, we're always talking about people from Venezuela. So, so any location that you mentioned here is a, is, is a destination country or destination um, uh, uh, region. Now, the, the, the ordering of these bars is based on the percentage of Venezuelans in that host uh, region um, using iOS devices, right? So Apple devices, which are typically more expensive, right? So make this concrete. Um, here in Roraima, Brazil, which is sort of the jungle that you would sort of, you know, walk to basically, you have very, very few Facebook users from Venezuela using iOS devices, right? Sort of 3%. On the other end of the scale, people who make it all the way to the United States, you actually have the majority of them using iOS devices, right? Sort of as a, so probably these are better off than, than, than these people, at least if you look at the devices that they're using to access Facebook. Now, how do we get from this sort of ranking to a supposed, think of this sort of as a sort of equivalent of per capita income in, with some hand waving? Okay, so the way that this works is we train a model to predict a country level per capita GDP using only the percentage of iOS devices in that country. Okay, so let me repeat that. So for example, we would, you know, maybe we, so we know the ground truth of, of the GDP per capita in Chile, nothing to do with Venezuela, just, you know, overall per capita GDP in Chile is, I don't know, let's, let's make it up, let's say 24,000 US dollars. I'm just throwing out a number. Um, and uh, 24,000 US dollars maps to 20% iOS usage in, in Chile among Facebook users, right? So then we learn a basically a, a, a simple linear regression that, you know, just maps sort of 20% iOS to 24,000 US dollars, right? And this mapping 20% to $24,000 is then applied to this sort of 3% and 54%, right? Sort of, so this is how we get sort of the, the, um, the, uh, the Y bars. Now, um, th this is not meant to be sort of precise in, in any sense, but what we do observe in all of our work, even when you sort of try, you know, different sort of model specifications, is that always these three groups um, emerge sort of, sort of where we would think that probably the group that only makes it to Colombia or Brazil, right? This is basically you walk to, right? Sort of or so. Um, they are probably in, in, in sort of worst off, financially speaking. And then you have sort of the sort of the, the middle middle class in a sense, sort of or sort of. So they're better off. And then people who make it all the way to Spain or the US are in aggregate probably of least concern, right? Of course, you know, there, there will be, you know, individual of concern, but as a sort of, as a group, you know, sort of, so they're probably doing better than, than the other groups. Uh, um, and, and again, we've, we've validated similar things also in other scenarios, for example, in, in, um, in Lebanon, looking at, at Syria. So this seems to work quite well. Um, and we were happy that this was also used uh, operationally, sort of, so and it continues to be used also by uh, um, IMAP. So this is one of the NGOs that we were working with, um, who uh, uh, continues to work with US uh, AID on the um, uh, topic. Um, it's not all rosy though. So also I wanna, you know, don't say, oh, this is perfect, you know, problem solved this sort of, so because I wanna show, show some of the issues when you use this sort of uh, data set. So um, here's a dashboard um, that we created for um, a UNHCR, right? Where sort of every other week we would sort of update, uh, in this case, how many people from Venezuela were living in Brazil, disaggregated by whatever, you know, relationship status and age and sort of other things, right? And then you see the sudden dip yeah, right, sort of, so this is like March, 2019, right? So what's, what, what's going on? Why does this now return migration or people continuing from Brazil to, I don't know, Argentina or something? Um, no, so what was happening in, in March, 2019 is that Facebook changed its algorithm, right? Sort of, so it just, and so how, how, how do we know that it's not, you know, that's not actually a return migration? Well, it's at, at the same point in time, globally, all the mig migration estimates suddenly dipped. Sort of, so, right? so it's not just not just Venezuelans and not just Brazil sort of so, right? and so we are pretty sure that you know sort of sort of so this is really induced by an uh, algorithmic um, uh, a change right sort of so, right? and so you kind of so so now of course this is you know so it creates a sort of discontinuity in this sort of file and how do you interpret this right do you sort of shift this up or sort of down sort of so right? and so this is now sort of like one of the sort of challenge right you build on top of a black box and this black box can change at any point in time, right? I mean, we don't get an email alert or sort of a sort of people telling us, right? Sort of a sort. And so this is one of the sort of the, the, um, the challenges. 
Um, how am I doing for time? Okay, so, okay, so far so good. Uh, another example, um, I want to elaborate one sort of mapping poverty, right? So, so I mean, already hinted at how the device type can be used um, uh, for this, right? So okay, I'll skip the motivation just to save some um, some time. So what we do um, in this work is we try to predict a uh, an asset based notion uh, of um, uh, 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 poverty, right? I mean, there's like sort of income based, not just things, but but here we are we are looking at at what the uh, demographic and health survey does, right? Sort of so so they, they they ask households about their asset ownership, right? They would ask, do you have a fridge? Do you have a mobile phone? Do you have running water, etc.? And then they sort of compile the survey answers down uh, into a single index called the the wealth index, right? And like a large positive number uh, means uh, a household has a lot of stuff. And a sort of negative number means you know they don't have any stuff, right? And so this now becomes our target, right? So only a few locations are sort of surveyed, and we want to sort of you know make out of survey predictions for locations that were not included in the um, uh, in the survey, right? And so what we would like to make uh, those predictions is our sort of features derived from uh, Facebook, right? So they they uh, include the device type usage, right? Sort of so like iOS or Android, but also importantly, and this is a very very strongly predictive feature. It's just the percentage of the population that uses Facebook, right? Just the Facebook penetration. So, so we later basically find that right, areas with higher Facebook penetration generally have a higher um, a wealth index. And then there's also information on the connectivity type, whether 4G is used or Wi-Fi is used and sort of other things, right? And so now with those features, right, we, you know, you throw it into your favorite sort of regression model. Uh, you know, you can try out whatever it is you, 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 um, you want. In this particular case, gradient boosting machines work like best, but you know, it doesn't really matter um, uh, sort of uh, too much, right? And it just becomes a um, uh, regression uh, task. So how well does this um, um, how well does this work? So let me try to walk you through this um, table. So uh, first, what would be like a baseline, right? I mean, of course, everything plays with everything, right? So you're going to get some result, right? Sort of so, but, but what should you compare it against, right? Like sort of so, what would you do if you didn't have any uh, you know any fancy big data sort of us right so one of the things that we wanted to compare against is you would just interpolate from dhs right so basically right you you look at uh, your sort of three three neighbors five neighbors ten neighbors or sort of so and we sort of different sort of combinations and you just average those right so if, if everybody close to you uh, has a high wealth index then you know probably your wealth index is also high right i mean because everything sort of spatially correlate and split cluster, right? So this is what you sort of see here, right? And this, this works already quite well, right? So in the Philippines, it explains almost uh, half the, the variance. And this is out of, out of sample um, uh, cross-validation, right? In India, it performs even more. There's even more sort of spatial autocorrelation um, um, uh, in India, right? So this is sort of, a, sort of kind of like a baseline. Then the sort of the vanilla version to compare against is then using just the Facebook features that I mentioned, right? Sort of so only Facebook alone, right? You see that in India, this already improves over this sort of looking at, at, at your neighbors, but in, 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 uh, in, in the Philippines, yeah, it improves in India, but in India, it does not. Right? Sort of so. And then you sort of, um, you know, you throw in you know, additional sort of features. For example, here's now a regional dummy, right? Sort of so. Are you in Kerala, let's say, in India, right? So it's so just like a state variable because maybe the poverty dynamics is, is, is different in different parts of a country, sort of. So, right? And then this sort of uh, improves in all the cases. And if you sort of throw it all, Sort of together, then you get like a further slight um, um, uh, improvement. Right? And so overall, this works quite well. I just want to quickly mention that sort of what you see down here is a sort of kind of an upper bound because the ground truth is actually noisy, right? So DHS data is noisy in at least two ways. So one is, of course, it's just a survey, right? Sort of or so. So it's not it's not a complete enumeration. So we sort of we do some sort of um, you know bootstrap resampling to get an estimate of uh, how much sort of uh, you know variance is there just in the estimator, right? And then the other actually bigger source of noise is that um, DHS deliberately perturbs the location to protect privacy. And we do some simulation to sort of, to estimate how much that sort of, you know, reduces the quality of the ground truth. And, and anyways, to, to sort of cut this sort of short, basically what we are sort of claiming here is that no model that does not just memorize the ground truth would be able to be this sort of upper bound. So if you have this sort of upper bound, you know, sort of 0.84 or sort of or so, and you can already explain 0.73, I mean, there's not, that much left to be explained in terms of so spatial variation um, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of wealth. Um, but other things we were interested in is not, again, sort of now sort of, sort of the demographic disaggregation, right? Like sort of, so, so here I'm showing the, the model that was trained in a non, I mean, we don't have demographically disaggregated ground truth. This is a model just to Facebook users with a high school degree, right? Or, or to Facebook users who are university graduates, right? 
And so what you see here is a graph for India where every, every dot is a location, right? Is, is a one of these DHS clusters. Um, and we have sort of two predictions, one for those uh, Facebook users who have um, you know, more than a high school degree, essentially university graduate, and, and, and one for those who, who, who do not, right? And, and in um, most of the locations, pretty much all of the locations, you know, th th those, uh, those Facebook users who have a university degree are predicted to be better off than those who do not, right? Okay, that's sensible sort of. So I would be interested to sort of see, to explore more, you know, those locations where we are sort of predicting the, the opposite. Um, the color basically sort of uh, 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 captures how, how, how urban or rural a location. Sort of red means a lot of users, so this is the urban areas, and then blue are sort of the, the, the rural areas. So Panchan here, this is at least a plausible prediction. Right? We don't have ground truth again, but at least it's a plausible high-level pattern. Now, we also uh, observed some predictions that are not plausible. So here I'm showing something similar, where we disaggregated our predictions by gender. Right? So now we're making a prediction just for um, you know, for uh, female Facebook users or just for male Facebook users. I know you see, wow, this looks pretty gender equal, right? In almost every location, we are predicting more or less the same sort of wealth index for men and for women, right? And sort of and so. But now I'm claiming this is not plausible. Why am I claiming this is not plausible? Well, based on other data, for example, from the World Economic Forum sort of global gender gap report, um, you know, India is, is, is ranked, uh, so here, 149th in terms of economic participation and opportunity out of 153 countries, right? So it's very far from uh, uh, gender equality, right? So this is just not plausible what we are observing here. And so, so what's going on? Why is our model failing so, so miserably here, right? Sort of, so it's clearly off the mark. It's a particular type of survivorship bias that's sometimes called the Jackie Robinson effect. So, so Jackie Robinson was the first African-American um, uh, uh, baseball player who played in the major league, sort of. Right? And for him to make it, despite all the racism, right? Like he had so many hurdles sort of put in front of him, but he still succeeded. But for him to succeed, right? I mean, he only succeeded because he was exceptionally good uh, at baseball, right? If you look at his bet betting averages, obviously he's an all-time great, right? So, so if you were then to extrapolate out from him, you would think, well, all African-Americans must be extremely good at um, you know, baseball. Well, those are the only ones you observe, right? I mean, they have to be, otherwise you wouldn't see them in the first place. And, and the same thing happens in India, sort of. So you have very few women on Facebook compared to the number of men, but those that we do see are exceptional. I mean, they're higher, uh, uh, they're better educated than men. They have higher, they have better devices than men, right? They, 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 they as an individual are probably better off, right? The ones that we do see are better off, right? But of course, we only, we only observe the ones that are better off, right? And so this now creates this sort of bias. So what can we do about this? Well, we can reduce our feature set, right? So if we use not, for example, the device type, we say, okay, the device type, this is too biased. We don't know exactly how to correct for this. Let's remove, get rid of this. But we only look at the Facebook penetration itself to make the prediction, which is also highly uh, strong rated. Then we get something that's more plausible, right? Sort of so, so now, based in every location sampled, um, you know, the, 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 the penetration among um, women is below the penetration among um, uh, uh, men, sort of, so the Facebook penetration, sort of, so, and so we would sort of predict that they have a lower um, a wealth index, right? And so, so this, this is at least the general trend now is sort of more, more plausible um, uh, here. Again, we're happy that this worked uh, also went beyond just the paper sort of, sort of, so at least the feature continues to be used by a partner of ours in the Philippines called Thinking Machines, who also incorporated it in, in, together with other features in models that they uh, built for um, uh, UNDP's um, uh, business plan. Um, okay, I quickly want to talk about digital gender gaps as well. I might skip a few things, but basically we sort of built models to predict internet, uh, I mean, to predict um, um, the female to male ratio of internet users using the female to male ratio of Facebook users. So, so what you see here is ground truth from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, on the female to male ratio of internet users, right? So for example, in the UK, you have pretty, I mean, it's close to, if not exceeding 1.0. So you have, you know, sort of the same internet penetration among women as you have among men. So it's basically gender equal in terms of internet access, right? Um, many other countries fall behind, but there are also a lot of white spaces, right? So even Canada is not very important. And so we build models to fill those data gaps, right? So now what I'm showing you here is a model, right? So it's now prediction based on Facebook data. And um, this model actually works works quite well, sort of, sort of, so again, there's an interest of time, I'll sort of skip some of the sort of the, the, the details and it works better than offline data, right, sort of, so and if you combine the, 
If you combine offline data with online data, then it works even better. But then the number of countries you can make a prediction for drops, right? Because now you need sort of two data sources to be um, uh, available. Um, and again, this we've also sort of uh, deployed through the uh, SDGs Today portal. So if you look at sort of SDG Today portal, they have three data sources. Two come from the UN themselves, and one comes from this uh, project on digital gender gaps. Um, but one of the uh, uh, nice things about this data is, again, we can do it in, in pretty much real time sort of us, right? So, um, so currently we're looking at what's going on in Afghanistan, right? So I mean, I'm sure you're, you're, you're aware that you know, uh, the, the, the Taliban took over in, in August last year, right? And so what does this mean for internet access in general? And in particular, what does it mean for, for women accessing the internet or social media, right? So it's, it's, it's not clear, right? I mean, most people fear that um, you know, probably women will you know, leave social media, you know, out of out of fear of sort of retaliation, sort of a sort of a so. But then there are also hopeful stories, such as in September last year, there was a sort of social media campaign uh, called uh, "Do Not Touch My Clothes," where um, you know, sort of women basically sort of uh, started a sort of like a counter movement, if if if, if you want, uh, uh, against uh, sort of suppression, right? And so, which way is it ultimately sort of going to go? So, what I'm showing you here is um, data looking just at um, um, uh, uh, adolescent girls aged 15 to 19. So in, um, in, in, in Afghanistan, right? So now we're only looking at Afghanistan. So, so in black, you have the total number of daily active users, you know, collected over time in thousands. Sort of. so, so you sort of see in late 2018, sort of it starts declining, probably as Facebook is declining globally. So especially among the age group, right? It's losing to like Snapchat and TikTok and sort of other um, uh, alternatives, right? Um, but then, as a sort of this sort of this dashed line is the fall of Kabul, sort of or so, is already sort of you know st starts going up towards this, and then during the fall of Kabul it dips, but after the fall of Kabul it sort of shoots up to levels not seen in many many years, right? So this is now this um, this sort of social media campaign, do not touch my clothes, sort of or so, and since then it has leveled off a bit, but still the, the total number of of adolescent girls using Facebook is still at levels not seen in many years, right? Sort of so, right? Like so, it's sort of oddly that the the sort of so far it seems that the um, Taliban takeover has been a bit of a catalyst for um, you know sort of uh, adolescent girls using um, a Facebook. Uh, and also, apart from their own number, also the female to male ratio has increased, right? So they used to make up so the ratio of sort of boys to girls used to be sort of uh, you know sort of uh, one to five. And now what's well, maybe one to four sort of also, right? so it's a somewhat um, uh, uh, improved. Um, apart from the real time nature, again, we can do this sort of, you know, subnationally. This is again, ongoing work where we're now doing this sort of um, looking at um, data for Africa in particular. This is a map for the sort of administrative two um, uh, uh, level where we're sort of predicting this female to male uh, ratio. In this case, it's of mobile phone uh, ownership. Um, I'm happy to, to sort of talk more about that uh, work if that's of interest. Um, okay, but I want to have some thoughts just to, to sort of to, to, to sort of philosophize a bit in a sense or to, to wrap up. So, um, so just recapping, okay, so what's sort of the strength and the weaknesses of such an approach, right? One of the strengths is that we can do this, not just for Facebook, but for LinkedIn and Weibo and Snapchat and, you know, anything that has targeted advertising, right? So, uh, so again, I'm here, I'm just showing Facebook because it's kind of the, the biggest game in town. But um, again, if, if we were also looking at, for example, in China, we're using Weibo for, for similar uh, analysis. You get near real-time estimates, right? I showed this in the case of sort of, um, um, you know, Venezuela or Afghanistan, et cetera. Um, it's anonymous and aggregate, right? I mean, I don't have individual level data, right? I and mean, we only get these, how many people match your criteria, right? I mean, that doesn't mean that there are no privacy concerns, but at least I, 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 never, ha I, I never deal with sort of, you know, uh, personally identifiable um, information. Um, there are a lot of different targeting attributes you could try, right? And of course, it's important you get this data free of charge, right? Again, and you, you, you know, listening, sort of, sort of, you have just as much access as, um, as, as I do. Um, but there are, you know, considerable drawbacks, right? I already mentioned this whole black box inference thing, right? Sort of, so and the black box can change in any time, right? We don't know exactly how Facebook infers, for example, somebody, if somebody is a migrant or not. We have some ideas, but ultimately we don't know uh, for sure, right? Um, you know, I mentioned about this sort of this, this biases, of course, it's understood not everybody is on Facebook sort of, so right? and sometimes it's interesting to look at exactly who's not on Facebook, right? Kind of for our gender gap mapping, it's kind of the, the missing people are the signal in a sense. 
but again, for the sort of poverty mapping work, that you know causes some sort of challenges, sort of, a, sort of, in terms of overcoming this. Um, uh, Facebook, you know, at least on the on the uh, internet platform, uses a sort of binary, sort of male female dichotomy, right, which might not represent everybody. That's another sort of shortcoming. Um, uh, uses pattern change over time, right? So even if you have something, and even if Facebook does not change their black box, right? But even if our model works today this particular model will probably not work you know five years down the road right because just how people interact with the platform will surely change right assuming the platform is still uh, still around right so you have to sort of update your models um, uh, over time right there's no historic data right so if you want to ask me oh great this looks fantastic can you give me data for i don't know uh, near the beginning of the pandemic or something no sorry i i i cannot right the advertising platform is for, for people advertising now and also, lastly, not uh, lastly, there is a risk of misuse, right? I mean, I, I can identify vulnerable populations, right? I mean, I, I can I identify uh, not individuals but groups, right? I mean, migrants in a sense are vulnerable, right? So if I can create maps of those, that that's that's a problem. Until earlier, in general, it was also possible to 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 target people based on religious interests, right? Sort of so. So it was possible. It's no longer possible to uh, create a map of, for example, where in Germany are people interested in Jewish holidays, right? Or kosher food or something. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Facebook probably realized, oh, well, this is a bit risky, sort of, sort of, so, and so, so now they removed everything related to religion, right? Sort of, so, so now you can no longer target people based on, um, you know, religion related interests. But still, you know, identifying uh, migrants as itself might already come, you know, if you think of Rohingya in, you know, Myanmar or sort of also who are fortunately not on Facebook, but you know, so disenfranchised, but you know, other migrant groups might still be vulnerable. The last thing to mention is um, everything so far is sort of passive, right? We just collect this data, we don't pay anything, you know, no user ever knows about this. But we have also done a bit of work and others have done more work on actively using it, right? Actually launching an ad and then okay, not, not to sell Coca-Cola or something, but to sort of recruit people into a survey, right? So for example, here we did a study sort of in India. Where we would sort of, um, you know, show uh, uh, like, 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 like a, you know, so basically uh, to understand Paytm uh, usage, right? Uh, or here in Qatar, we are uh, working on um, public health uh, health messaging, which is in a bit more sort of targeted manner, sort of, so not just like a blanket campaign, you know, one size fits all, but sort of, you know, just doing basically marketing 101, adjusting the um, the message sort of to the to the recipient. And then you could take this even sort of uh, further. This is not something that we are currently working on, which is sort of you know sort of real time on demand social sensing, right? So um, it's related to an idea that other people had, where you know if you, if you tweet on if you if you mention on Twitter, oh uh, did I just feel an earthquake, right? And then this bot sort of a sort of a so would reply to you and say, hey, did you feel it or something, right? And so here, what we would like to do is something similar but different, right? So suppose there's an earthquake, right, that hits Haiti, then we would immediately, right, like automatically or semi-automatically sort of launch an ad campaign targeting different locations. In each of these locations, we would then show, um, I mean, something like a survey, but even simpler, just like a poll, right? Not a poll whether you have a superpower or not, but whether, you know, um, are you still staying in your house, right? Uh, is there, I don't know, you have electricity, um, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, sort of. And the goal is that within a couple of hours after a disaster, we would have like a geographic map of um, you know sort of this basic uh, uh, you know answers to this poll, right? so it's 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 somewhat related to sort of Facebook safety check that you might be familiar with, right? But it's sort of more um, more flexible, right? You can ask sort of any question um, uh, you know you, you like, not just whether you're safe um, or not. And then my uh, penultimate slide, I think, is um, you know why are we doing this work, right? Of course, we are. You know, this is mantra, you know, sort of the, you write, put in a paper, sort of, so, you know, better data will lead to better decisions, sort of, so, right? But, you know, we're all grown ups here. It's not clear whether that's actually true, right? Like, um, um, you know, sort of for global warming, we've had data for decades and, you know, hasn't led to a lot of good decisions so far, right? So, uh, you know, also have to be sort of humble ultimately, right? Sort of say, you know, you, of course, we, you know, I'm a data scientist. Hopefully, this work will be useful and, you know, lead to a better world or sort of a sort, but better data alone will not. Um, you know, fix uh, systematic issues, right? Sort of also, but uh, hopefully can just highlight uh, those issues. And then just a tiny bit of advertising. Um, if this general topic is of interest to you, and especially if you happen to work on related things, right? Sort of uh, related to sort of social media. Um, so we are organizing a, a special track at the conference ACM uh, Good IT um, uh, on sort of the topic of, you know, of using social media for humanitarian and development terms. We have a fantastic 
program committee with a lot of uh, UN folks from UN OCHA, World Bank, IOM, um, uh, et cetera, sort of so, as well as industry people and others. So it's, uh, I'm sure it's a very, very nice um, uh, event. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And I'd be happy to use any time left for, for discussion and to answer questions. That's super. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Ingmar. I'll just um, stop recording at uh, 